Hi there, and welcome back. Scott here, and I'm glad you can join me. As promised, we're going to talk about what I think is a pretty cool car. 1989 Pontiac Turbo Trans Am. There it is. We're also going to talk to my friends over at a paintless, dentless repair facility. They've done a lot of work for me and good quality work actually. So they're going to kind of educate us on the industry as well and explain something to me that I don't really get or understand and that is section cups and their impact on paint. Cue the banjo. Okay, here it is, 1989 TT8. Now I'm gonna do something a little different today. It's 100 degrees outside, and by the time I pour the cars inside the shop, shut the doors, it gets 105, 110 degrees inside the shop. So today we're inside my own garage, which has AC, and it's just a little bit more comfortable. This car's got 5,000 miles on it. The bottom of the car looks as if it could be rolled right off the um, showroom floor. It could probably eat off the bottom of it. It comes with the two options you could get, which were the T-tops and the leather interior. A read of the production numbers on this car, they had 15 hard tops with cloth, 24 hard tops with leather, 187 T-tops with cloth, 1,324 T-tops with leather, one pre-production pilot car with hard top leather, and four pre-production pilot cars with T-tops with cloth. There were three pace cars that they attached strobe lights to and sent them out to the track. I believe this is the first Indianapolis pace car that didn't have any modification to the production car other than strobe lights. Put the lights on it, send it out there. Now, 5,000 miles on a car of this age that's been sitting this long, it, it's not good. I tell my customers that have classic cars, drive your cars. They're made to be driven. So when I bought this car, of course, it had no leaks. Oh, it has no leaks. Of course it doesn't have any leaks. You haven't driven it to, to find any of the leaks. So I knew what to expect when I got it. One of the first things I noticed and attacked were all the bushings. Uh, the bushings were all shot. They were decayed. The rear sway bar didn't even have any bushings. In leaks were missing. It was, I, I, I knew to expect that having not driven the car. And, and those were done. We replaced that. Then we concentrated on leaks. And so I put some miles on it, and that's when the leaks are really going to start rearing their ugly heads. Uh, we replaced the pan gasket on the 204R transmission. We replaced the gaskets in the power steering pump. We actually rebuilt the power steering pump, so it's got the original power steering pump. That was really all the leaks that we had to contend with. Flushed all the fluids in the vehicle, so all new fluids in the vehicle. We had to replace one of the headlight motors. It was a little saggy, and didn't want to come up. Come on, little buddy, try, you can do it. Replace the shocks. They were riding a little bit rough. I kept the original shocks in case I pass this on and somebody wants those, but I do have new shocks on there. We replaced the refrigerant in the car, R12. Back in 2000, I bought cases of R12 the stockpilot, knowing that it wasn't going to be made anymore. And no, it's not for sale. Uh, again, we flushed all the fluids and the tires. This came with the original tires on it. I believe they're gator backs. And that's pretty cool and everything, but these things are as hard as a rock. Riding around on these things was like riding around on four suicide missions. So those were replaced. Now, this car is kind of anomaly when you really think about it. Pontiac with a Buick motor in it. And it had lots of uh, upgrades from the 1987 GNX motor. It also had a lot of items that were items from like bean counters. Back in the 80s, it seemed like a lot of the car companies were run by bean counters. Now they're run by the engineers and designers and it, I believe it's much better. When we think about some of the things that are odd from a accounting perspective or a cost cutting perspective, one of them, and I touched on it before, was the fuel pumps in the tank. Of course it should be, uh, but there's no access panel to the fuel pump. So when you have to replace the fuel pump, you have to drop everything that's below it. That's rear axle, 
suspension, exhaust, you name it, it comes out to get to that. Now, I have seen people on YouTube cut an access panel back there. I'm not going to do that on this car. So that, that won't happen. Same with the shocks. There's no access panel for the rear shocks up here. So you take out the back seat and some of the carpet to get to the access to the rear shocks. I, I, I can only imagine that they didn't do that just for cost savings. It costs money to put access panels in. But one of the most odd ones, I think, is, is a story that's out there about these cars is when they designed these wheels and the offset on these back wheels are different than the offset on the front wheels. So when they originally designed this car, the front wheels interfered with the suspension geometry of the car. So when it turned, it would hit the suspension geometry. So they came up with an idea of putting the back wheels on the front and the front wheels on the back. I wonder how that conversation went. <laughs> Bill, we've got a problem. These wheels with the front offset, they interfere with the steering geometry and they rub when you turn. We're going to have to design these, all these wheels again. Oh, no, 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 Todd. The accountants will never go for that. Try putting the back wheels on the front, the front wheels on the back. Hmm. Okay, we can, we can try that. Anyway, there's also things done to this car that were improvements. I think the value of this car is going up. I think it should be somewhere placed in between the GNX and the Grand National because of its exclusivity in numbers over the Grand National. But they did some improvements. The engineers did get their way on several things on this car that were improvements over the 87 Grand National Motors. The heads, well the heads they had to change. To get the engine in between the shock towers of this car, they had to change the heads. And they used the heads from the 3.8 transverse mounted V6 motor on here. In doing so, they had to change the pistons on there. But all of this ended up uh, resulting in a uh, increased uh, airflow through the heads. Also, they have stainless steel headers. They have a cross-drilled crank. Say that 10 times fast for better oiling. The intercooler on this is from the GNX 12-inch unit uh, as opposed to the GN or Grand National 10-inch unit. And it has bigger brake booster, I believe. Uh, speaking of the brakes, the rotors are a 12-inch unit from the police package. And the calipers are from the Corvette. Twin piston up front, single piston in the rear. These were set up for quick change. I believe this was done for homologation in the Firehawk Racing Series. And you can change these pads on each side, each corner, in 30 seconds to a minute. The interior on this car, I love it. It just screams 1980s access. Excess. It's got this rad stereo to it with a, a, a digital little screen, or I don't know what those screens are called, with the little, um, and an EQ to it, equalizer, tape, steering wheel controls. Who had steering wheel controls? Pontiac did it, I know, on several other cars, but it has steering wheel controls for the radio, which I think is really unique. It's got cruise control, AC, power lumbar seats. I, I can't say enough about this car. I really like it. It's, it's great to drive now that we've got everything kind of worked out. I wouldn't be surprised if I put a couple, you know, 100 more miles on this car, something else develops that we'll have to address. But overall, this, is, this has been a great car. I don't want to put too many miles on this car. I, I, I guess I kind of contradict myself, put your miles on the car, but I really want to save this and keep it a little bit lower miles on here than my other cars, because I want to take this to Radwood. Uh, up in Austin, I think it'll really show well in Radwood, so I'm kind of waiting for that before I'm doing kind of daily driving on it. This car came with a lot of its original documentation, including the promotional box that was given to the owner upon purchase. 
It's got the original decals that go on the side of the car from the Indianapolis 500 promotion, owner's manual, spare set of keys, and a neat little keychain, and a cassette tape that I don't have the courage to take out of the cellophane wrapper, but I'm so curious to figure out what's on that tape. And it also came with a brochure and an order form for some really cool stuff. I wonder if that totally rad jacket is available still. Probably not. I'm sure those all sold out. As well, these cars were shipped uh, to PAS as original GTA 5.0 liters. They actually gave you a credit for the 5.0 liter engine and then charged you $8,800 to put in the uh, 3.8 liter Buick motor. That put this price of the car per this documentation at $31,544.16. The emblems to the side of the car, the Turbo Trans Am emblems, were not included upon shipment of the vehicle. And there's a letter included that says to the original owner that, sorry, basically, we did not have the emblems in stock from our vendors at the time of shipment to your car. Here are the emblems, here are the instructions, here are the templates to put them on, and a check if you so choose to have somebody else put it on for labor cost. They never did that. These emblems still sit in their wrappers and I think that's really unique to this car. I'm not going to put them on. I think it tells the story of the car, and I just don't want to change that. I think that's, that's a unique story. So this car supposedly was the fastest production car you could get in 1989. I don't know what that means in today's terms. Probably not much, but it has its place. This is actually a really nice place to be. The road manners on this car, not too bad. I replaced the shocks, like I said, and I, I replaced them with an adjustable shock. I could not find a, a part number or a, a, a superseded part number or anything for the WS suspension shocks, and nobody knew what it would be. This car still was known for its creaks and rattles. It's got T-tops on it, and it was already known for its kind of rough handling anyway. I put QA1 shocks on here, they're adjustable. I thought that was the best thing to do, given I couldn't really find a replacement part for the, the true WS suspension. And I kept the original shocks in case I roll this car over and somebody wants the, those shocks. Uh, I tuned in the suspension how I thought I like it, but I spend most of my time on the highway, so that's how I tuned it. I said, this place is a pretty nice place to be. The interior is great. The AC on this thing, uh, like I said, I kept the R12 in here because I have a bunch of it stockpiled up. Hooked it up to a vacuum. It held a vacuum, just replaced it, and it's, it's ice cold. It's been 93, 95, 97 on a couple of days. I've used it in the last week or so. And I have to turn the AC down. I'm in the number one setting on the AC right now, and I'm cold. I, I love R12. Supposedly, the reason when you convert uh, an R12 system over to uh, the 134 A systems, the issue is the condenser up front and the orifices that the gases run through. So, the orifices on, and this is how I understand it, I could be wrong, and this is somebody could correct me, but as I understand it, the orifices on the condenser up front for an R12 system are a little bit bigger because of the nature of the refrigerant and it passes through the room, the condenser through its own speed. When you change it over to a 134 uh, system, they, when they went to that new gas, they changed the condensers. They made those orifices in the condenser a little bit bigger or smaller, excuse me. They made them a little bit smaller to account for the type of gas it was. It needed more time to go through that, that system and to cool off and, and do its job than the R12 did. So when you roll something over from an R12 system to that uh, an updated system, it is going through, it's, that gas is going through at a different rate than it would for um, a, a, a 134 system. And it's going past their 
here too fast so you're supposed to lose a little bit of cooling properties a little bit of temperature when you switch over from a, a r12 system to a 134 system if you can't change the radiator uh, ac radiator up front so that's why i didn't want to convert it over i don't really know if that's all that together true i, I rule over the um or converted over the rx7s AC to 134 and that's also really really cold so and also you have to and I don't know what the conversion is you have to roll over and when you do that the, the calculations different as far as how much refrigerant you put in from an R12 system to a 134 system you can't just say well the R12 system held three pounds so I'm gonna put three pounds of 134 in there it doesn't work that way there's a conversion I forget what it is I had to look it up but there's a conversion that you would want to do so you don't overfill or underfill the art the new system that you're converting over to 134 I think this is a pretty good place to before I get up in traffic up here to kind of break this video off it's getting a little long and I'm gonna put part one and then part two and then we'll jump over to the second one thanks for joining me and we'll catch you on the next one real, real shortly.